Oh, there's your looking here. Hello. Hello, how are you? I am good, thanks. How are you? Thank you for coming. My pleasure, I have to show you. Yes, I love it. That's from the TWD. Oh, it's yeah. so nice. Looks comfortable too. No, it's very comfortable. It's very comfortable. <laughs> Tyler, where are you talking to me from? From Plymouth. <laughs> oh, nice. I don't know if you've heard of it. I know you've, you know, you've got some sort of English background. And yes, I do. But Plymouth was, of course, we have Plymouth Rock in America. Which yeah. was you, you guys coming, crossing the waters and renaming the first place they landed, the Pilgrims landed, it's Plymouth Rock. It was a big deal. Oh. We always go see it. No, know. go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, we obviously because we've got we're a navy, we're a navy kind of base, navy place, I guess. So I know you know, in your family have you know military and, and background too. So then if they've, they've probably been here. That yes, we've been we we've been to Plymouth maybe once. My father was in the intelligence at, at Knightsbridge Barracks and then underground with General Eisenhower in World War One and World War Two. <laughs> I'm doing great this morning. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and where are you, where are you, um, Aiden, where are you? I'm in Tennessee. I'm in a little town called Crossville. Nice. Nice. I have relatives that live in Big Sandy, Tennessee. Oh, okay. I don't know where that is. My daughter-in-law's parents, my daughter-in-law's parents. We haven't been to their farm, but I'm sure it's beautiful. <laughs> so what can I do for you boys? We have a bunch of, of Walking Dead questions and, um, I'm going to talk about your book too. Um, Please. Which which would you like to start off with? Would you like to start off with the book, or would you like to start off with Walking Dead? I think I'd like to start out with the book, which I just will get now. One second, and there in the book there is a whole chapter or a whole uh, missive about the Walking yeah. Dead and how much I, I loved being on it of course i have to find out where i put that but i'll look in the table of contents. it's funny you write these books and uh yeah 215 yeah no it's the intermission it has a big big entry so i'd like to talk about the book and then how it relates how it related to uh, the walking dead maybe we yeah. do that that sounds no? great um okay. for those who don't know tova has a new book that come out like two days ago, three days ago? Yeah, it just came out last week called Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played. And I am the granddaughter of a, of a, of a British subject. I want you to know that. So this is from the, the loving granddaughter of people of my family who I still have ties to England in Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played from the granddaughter of a British subject. Ada Tobias Kaplan, who crossed the waters in 1902 to marry her love, also a British subject, Gershon Kaplan, who had immigrated earlier uh, from Russia and lived in England where he met Ada. And then they moved to uh, Manhattan, 2nd Avenue and 17th Street, not to be confused with the Lower East Side, um, and uh, made, made their way and gave birth to four children, one of whom was my mother, Lily, pictured right here. This is December 8th. This picture here is from my bat mitzvah. And the bat mitzvah is when a Jewish girl becomes, becomes a Jewish woman and is called to the altar and says uh, chants from, in my day, hot Torah. In my day, we weren't allowed to touch the Torah. Nowadays, with gender equality, thank you, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the second wave of women's liberation, the women have the same rights, at least in the conservative and reform synagogue, as they do as the men. So they can... They can touch the holy books and wear a prayer shawl and wear a skull cap. And I'm not even that observant, but I do love my uh, religious and ethnic background. I'm proud of it. It's, it's an amazing book. And, you know, obviously we know the, the inspiration of the book because it's about your amazing, amazing mum who I've loved hearing. I, I love the audio book because it's, I, you know, for me, I like to like relax and close my eyes and imagine I'm either like watching a play version like you intended or you're, you know, I'm, yes, I'm you. Like I can see it through your eyes. That's, I, you. that's I, it's just such a gripping story and you, you're just amazing. You've had an amazing life and it's so interesting to hear about it. 
well, Tyler, the thing is, when I was asked to write a memoir, I said, just to write another celebrity and memoir also, I mostly am on Broadway. Of course, I'm in television and of course, The Walking Dead and in film, but I'm not, I know I'm not Tom Cruise. You know, I know I'm not an international entity. So I said, how can I make this memoir deep enough to go into the river of common human experience? Well, I went to the parent-child relationship, and in this case, the mother-daughter. Perfect gift for Mother's Day, I must say. But, and, and I, I depicted my life through my mother's eyes and my mother's life through my eyes. And we started out very, very separately. And eventually, because she lived till over 103, we were like two separate trees and we were able to bower our branches until they intertwined and really found true intimacy and haven and, and unconditional love with each other. And it didn't begin this way, but the book has a happy ending. And my mother lived long enough for she and I to figure us out. And the journey to do that is, <laughs> is both humorous, I hope touching, I hope profound. That was uh, my job is to move you as an actor and even as a writer. And I do encourage you, buy the hardcover, of course, buy the hardcover. If you really want to buy the hardcover, you go to my website, you can, I can write you a personalized book plate. So if you send I'll me put the link down in there. That's right. That's right. Uh, and then I, I, I would, thank you. That's right. Exactly. Thank you so much, Aiden. And, uh, and uh, once you read the hardcover and you get all the beautiful illustrations, I certainly encourage you to let me keep you company as you bike, as you jog, as you go to sleep, or as you wake up in the morning on the audiobook because I got permission to sing. So I sing on the audio book. Uh, yeah, I love I love it's very useful. singing. It's I know amazing. I'm quite jealous. That's why I'm definitely gonna have to get the audiobook and listen to it. <laughs> good, good, Aiden. How long did it take? Because obviously it's it's a long, long book and so many, so much information and, and story. I was wondering how long it took you to, to even even write that? It took two years, pretty much. Um, about two years ago, I did an interview with Dalton Ross and his partner, Jessica, on Entertainment Weekly. And my beloved agent, Albert Lee, who's now at UTA, and then eventually his partner, Lane Zachary, listened to this interview uh, by happenstance, called my Hollywood managers and said, does Tova Felcher have a literary agent? They said, no. And they said, actually, he said, I think she has a writer's voice. So they came to the house and Albert said, what do you want to write? And I said, I want to write about my mother. I'd like to write a TV series, but I don't know how to write a pilot yet. I'm actually in the process now of writing Lilyville as a TV series, of pitching it as a oh, TV wow. series. Okay, so but they, he said, look, I'm a literary agent. I'm not interested in that. I need a book, I need a book. <laughs> I said, why don't I write about my relationship with my extraordinary mother? Because she was a medical experiment. She lived till over 103. Um, uh, she was a shy, uh, not retiring, but shy, very capable, giving my father all the light and all the spotlight woman and mother, a perfect 50s wife, uh, never told me she loved me. And maybe you Brits get that with your stiff upper lip. But let me tell you, here in America, particularly in New York, and particularly as a Jewish girl. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. It's like not having an Italian mother tell you she loves you. You know, Can you imagine <laughs> not having a moding? So um, I think there's an old Eastern European tradition that says we shouldn't praise our children too much, but if they get too proud, if they have hubris, overwinning pride, the gods will come and strike them down so that you don't spoil a child. And the one way you don't spoil is that you don't, tell them you, you love them, which I think is like, what, you know. So to make a long story short, my mother showed her love in deeds. Uh, and in my religion, we call them mitzvahs, acts of loving kindness. If you look at Deanna Monroe, she does a lot of acts of loving kindness. She's yeah. the head of a community. She's a protagonist. She's not an antagonist. Everybody was waiting. I was always asked, is she going to be an evil force? And I said, not on my watch. She's not <laughs> going to be. Um, and I... As I, I got this notion to write a, write a book about my mother and me, <clears throat> and of course have interludes about my career. And I finished the first manuscript and my editor said, lovely, like pearls on a coffee table. It's not a book. I said, it's not a book. What do you mean it's not a book? I said, it isn't strung together enough. So my friend, Jeff Harner, who directs me in my one woman shows, 
and eventually would come into my virtual writing room. I, I, I spoke every word of the book to him um, and he certainly helped me hone uh, my writer's voice and help me structure the book. He said, what do you know best? That was what was crucial. And I said, I know theater. And he said, why don't you write this as a theater piece? That was his suggestion and I just flew with it. So instead of chapters, I give you scenes. In, in the play is written in uh, the play, listen to me. The book is written <laughs> in three acts with two intermissions. Instead of a prologue, you have an overture. Instead of um, an afterward, you have uh, exit music. Instead of acknowledgments, I throw a cast party and celebrate all the people who helped me, including my wonderful assistant, Oliver Scholson, who was a linguistics major at Yale. So by the time I finished the manuscript in the form of a play, welcome to the theater of my memories, Oliver was able to say a comma here, not a comma there. This is an Oxford comma. He knew so much about punctuation. And I was very well educated, let me tell you, but he was a great asset and he saved the proofreaders at Hachette. Uh, the book publishers, uh, I'm sure, hours of work. We submitted this new manuscript, completely redone, or I submitted it, in the form of a theater piece. And uh, my editor, Lauren Marino, was more than pleased. But you know, Aiden and Tyler, when you write something or when you're in a play or when you're in a, hit, in a series, you don't know what's going to be a hit. You just keep your head down in the artistic tunnel. You do, you do what you're supposed to do day by day, and you hope. And... Um, and, and Lilyville has turned out to be um, a sought after memoir because I think it deals with the hope that no matter what your relationship is with your folks, you can fix it. You can remedy it. You can make a decision. Happiness is a choice. When I turned 40, my mother said to me, Talva, how much longer are you gonna blame me? And I said, not another moment. So by the, by the time she was 80, to the time she was 103, a good 23 years, we became very close. And um, we're, we were always great project managers. When I had to get married, uh, uh, and we did it very quickly and elegantly at the plaza, we, we ran that wedding, wedding like, a, like an iron ship. It was, it, was, it was great. We were very, very capable. But that is not the exchange necessarily of emotion. It's the exchange of a collaboration. And <clears throat> in the book, I learned to love my mother as she could appreciate, and she learned to love me as I could appreciate. She, she did tell me she loved me. She did, so lucky me. Okay, um, I do want to comment. Um, my father is from Scotland, so I'm half Scottish, and he always would tell me, you know, my parents <laughs> never told me they loved me, and I never knew why. So you've actually offered me quite a bit of insight there as to why that wasn't a thing in some European countries, because. I, I, I'm glad. I thought it was very weird. Weird. And it's it, to toughen a child up and to understand that they have to work for respect. I think my way of parenting, what I have concluded having been parented by Lily and pushed against that, I got very lucky. People said, how did you manage? How did My mother taught me the resiliency, but I managed because my father loved me unconditionally. And he expressed it. He was a litigator. He was a barrister. And uh, he was verbal. And I'm verbal. And he used to go, Terry Sue, doodle doo doo. I love you, doodle doo doo. Yes, I do, doodle doo doo. You can see, even as I sing it to you, I go back in time to that place of being this kid, you know, looking up at my daddy. And he lo -ha -ha loved me. So I took that love. And whenever I got frightened on the stage in the early parts of my career, in the black velvet of the audience, I would put a thousand Sidney Felchers, a thousand. <clears throat> the pillar of my unconditional love, and I would do the play for him. If I had to do the play for Lily, I would have been scared to death. <laughs> and she was the woman who walked into the living room when I was doing, you know, <laughs> and she would come in and she'd say, don't you have to be born with a voice? And that done did it for me, Aiden, for about two decades, three decades. So I've noticed that since mom has died, that I've become very much more not only courageous, but really enjoying singing. I mean, you're wonderful strangers to me. We're on a Zoom. What am I doing uh, verbalizing my expression through singing? Because I'm not afraid anymore and I'm not gonna wait. Time, time is ticking, ticking away. But that must have been a common way of raising uh, children. Listen, it reminds me of when uh, the Duke of Edinburgh insisted that uh, Charles go to Gordonson, and I know Gordonson was great, but not for Charles. 
not for that little boy. He needed poetry. He didn't need what Gordonson had to offer at that at that time. So um, it it uh, did it toughen Charles up? I don't, I don't know. I think it robbed him of years of real intimacy with the Duke. But who am I? I'm just a commoner from America trying to be an amateur psychologist. So that's my <laughs> that's my nose about it. That's my nose. Um, what advice would you give um, new aspiring uh, writers? to, you know, have their own book or? Well, first of all, write from what you know. You know, how do you stop the conveyor belt? I said to myself, how do we, I'm, I'm an auditioner, right? Because I'm an actor. So I still have to audition for some roles. Some roles are handed on a silver platter, like Naomi Bunch in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, like Deanna Monroe in The Walking Dead, uh, like Danielle Melnick in Law and & Order and other parts, um, like Catherine Hepburn, I had to fight for you, see, because they couldn't quite imagine me playing Catherine Hepburn, but then I said, you don't know me. You're just looking at my name and making a judgment about me, and I know perfectly well how to play a fantastic wasp from Connecticut who goes into the Connecticut River every day. Um, so as an auditioner, I said, how do we stop the conveyor belt on my, my contribution? Where can I contribute? So go as deep as you can, from what you know, if you're a contractor, we call them contractors in the United States, and you're constructing a house, write about the house and how you do it, not just the how, but what's it like to go into the planet Earth? What does it mean to dig a foundation? So that you go to what you do and then you go to metaphor. How do I make it deeper? So Lilyville shouldn't just be about Lily and me. It should be about mother, daughter, but more than that, it should be about parent, child, parent, child. And then if you go deep enough, you are bound to inspire somebody. If you go deep enough, the reader will start to run their tape as they read your story. And once they run their own tape, you're in. Once you have somebody say, oh, that reminds me of my mother. Once you have a wonderful Aiden saying, uh, my Scottish father never told me he he was never told him he never told me he loved me. We're in. We're 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 linked. We're linked. And I think, frankly, not telling people you love them is a lousy way to bring up a kid. You don't have to spoil a kid. There are barriers. I told my children two things. I did. I put in my children what I wanted for them, and I would put them to sleep at night. I would say, "I'm the luckiest mommy in the world. I have such an empathic child." I have a person that walks into a room and say, what's wanted and needed? I have a person who, when he sees garbage on the floor, or she sees garbage, she picks it up to help the other guy. I have a person that does more than their share. And my little girl, Amanda, when she was little, she went, Ma, mommy, what empathic, what empathic. I said, it's to feel with someone, to feel with. So you put into them what you want for them. And then they start to imbibe those virtues and become thus. And I told the little children one more thing. I love you unconditionally. I give you my kidney. Any parent who isn't insane would literally die for their child. However, once you leave this house and you're 16, and particularly after your 18th birthday, I cannot protect you from federal and state law. There are, there are limits. If you are going to do a U-turn illegally and you will be cited, I'm not fixing a ticket. I don't have the power to do it. Um, one time my beloved daughter, Amanda, uh, went away for a camp holiday and she went with two very wealthy friends and they weren't that pleased with the camp. So they just left, went to their compound. And these were families that followed us. I did all the research. It was a wonderful arts camp. And my daughter would be in the New York City Ballet Children's Corps for four seasons. And she said, I want to come home. I said, you're not coming home. You don't come home. You don't have a compound, a summer home, a Humvee, uh, a British nanny. We don't, we don't have those things. You are contracted to be at this camp, breathe deep, make new friends and stay the course and come home on the bus. So, um, and they're marvelous. She ended up at MIT with, as a physics major. She did okay, that kid and our son Very went good. to Harvard and then our son went to Oxford. Our son played, was head of the junior varsity at Harvard for soccer, but he played as you would say football for Oxford on the, on the varsity. And oh, wow. there I was, all the foreign mothers, myself and all the Asian mothers watching our boys play. 
at Oxford. <laughs> I don't think there was a British mother around. Sitting, we were sitting there with umbrellas, you know, watching our boys. Oh, it was such a thrill, his graduation from Oxford. He got his master's of financial economics at, at Oxford. And it was just beyond belief. I'd never been, I'd never been to a graduation that was mostly in Latin. It was pretty, pretty great, pretty great. So that's what I would tell a writer. Also, don't give up. Uh, you know, authors get nine no's. You only need one yes. I'm now writing a television series. You think I know? I'm giving myself my own advice. It's my first time I've ever written a television series. Don't you think some people are going to say uh, no? So what do you do? There's a there's a uh, there's a toy in Germany called the Stay Off Mention, and the Stay Off Mention means the stand up the stand up person, right? Stay Off Mention Mention person. So you push it down, it's a little clown, and it comes right back up. When I was a little kid, it was called Joe Palooka. We'd punch it, it would come right back up. That's what you need to do, not only as an artist, as a CEO, as whatever. I am about to play, I don't know if you know her, but I'm about to play Dr. Ruth Westheimer uh, in a play about her called Becoming Dr. Ruth, uh, sexually speaking. I hope you're all good. I hope your penises are good. I hope everybody is in very good shape. And she, her favorite toy is the Stay Off Mansion. She said, when I am pushed down and I'm pushed down, I come right back up, right back up. And she is so committed to optimism, as is, as is Lilyville, that she ends her sentences with an upswing. I'm going to the store and I'm going to see the person and I'm going to say, how are you? Are you having good sex? And could I please have some chewing gum? You know, so uh, <laughs> that's her thing. And before that was Deanna Monroe, of course, who had tremendous hope, depth, leader of a community, a senator. I had so many to base my character on, Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton in her salad days. She was our senator. She was, she was great. And um, it was quite something when she was uh, uh, defeated and what happened in the next four years. But we're back on course now. And I'm not talking yeah. politically. I'm talking about being a mensch. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean for Rick? in the walking dead to be a human being. Is there a better human being than Andrew Lincoln? I don't think so. I'm <laughs> no, telling you, I, what a guy to work with amazing. those people. He is amazing. Normie is amazing. I wrote Norman. I said, Norman, would you plug the book immediately on Instagram? He has 7 yeah. million followers. He said, my friend Tova Felscher wrote, Liliva, Ruth said to me, Tova, listen to me. Are you listening? I want you to pick up the book and put it next to your face. Don't forget. So here's the book. And uh, so Norman is great, Deny is great, and she's a playwright. They were all marvelous. Melissa, she gave me skin cream. I had the best two years down in Atlanta and the honor of working with those artists. And wh why were they great? Because A, they didn't know what they had. They did their best. It was extraordinary. By the second season, they were number one in the world for cable uh, uh, television. But listen, you think it's hard to get there? Try to stay up there. True. They put their... They stayed in the tunnel. And I know when I was on seasons five and six, we were still number one. Every week was like a little mini feature. 100% commitment, clarity, and you wanna, you wanna take care of yourself? So take care of your own hubris. Don't sit on your laurels. Don't have overweening pride. You, you can do it yourself. You don't have to have a parent that says, I don't love you. I mean, or I that they didn't, you know, the thing is, Aiden, they didn't say they didn't love us. They just didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Mm. When my mother used to come backstage to Yentl, which is how I had the wonderful honor of having an acquaintanceship with Barbara Streisand, who's also mentioned in Lilyville, Mother Daughter, and Other Worlds of Play. When I had the pleasure of playing Yentl, it was my first marquee. My mother came backstage and I would go, I was 24 years old. I'd go, Mommy, Mommy, milk, milk. She had size C breasts. My daughter has size C breasts. I have size A acorns. And when my daughter came home from La Coruña, Spain, my mother took a look at my daughter, she took a look at me and she goes, wow, I guess it skips a generation. So that was her comment about our bosoms. But I was running after her in the dress room as a grown woman, starring in a play, mind you, saying, mommy, mommy, milk, milk, mommy. She says, get out of here, get out of here. Do you love me? I would say, do you love me? Oh, stop it, do you love me? And finally she said, of course I love you. Who takes you in the station wagon to your singing lessons, to your dancing and, and Hebrew school? Who makes food for you? Who takes you to Saks Fifth Avenue for your dresses? We only go to Alexander for our undergarments. Who takes care of you while your father's at the law office? And that's how, so Aiden, I invite you to find the ways your father showed his love to you. Find the ways, you know. 
Um, it's, it's interesting. I have this with one very close member of my family who married into the family. They're from a different culture and it's a different language. And I'm trying to learn that language because I love that person and I'm older and it's my job to love that person. It's my job. So there we are. I love talking to you guys. You make me miss England. Yeah, my cousins okay. live in, in Hampstead. My husband's live in Hampstead, Hertfordshire, and uh, my beloved Lord Bernard Ricks. You have a great country. You know, when Gershon crossed the waters with his sewing machine on his back, his mother was killed in a pogrom, the Easter pogroms, in uh, I think it was 1892 in Minsk, in White Russia. He walked across Poland, got to Danzig, and came to London. It was fir first breath of fresh air. They were celebrating Victoria's um, Jubilee and it was, England was fantastic. And our friend, uh, Bernard Ricks, who went to Harvard Law School with my husband and then went on to become not only a barrister, but he, he's in the high courts and he's a lord. And then uh, his, her, his wife is Lady, Lady Karen Ricks. This is, this is a Jewish kid whose parents were Czech immigrants. So bless you, England, for the meritocracy you still have. And I Duff a hat to you. I really do. Um, so in the memoir, which truthfully I'm not finished with because I'm in college, so I'm only through scene three, so you may explain this later, but um, you mentioned that you bring gifts to people on the opening nights of productions. Um, is this something you do for like other projects you worked on, like TV shows, or is this just specifically for live events? Oh, that's very interesting. It's specifically for theater, though, when I left The Walking Dead, I made gifts for everybody when I left it. But it started in theater. It's a very common practice to give opening night gifts. But more than that, there's a word in German called Kinderstube. Kinderstube, my father's family is Austrian and German. Kinder, it wouldn't German, German. My father's fluency in German saved his life. That's the other thing. Try to learn two languages at least. I speak five, not because I'm fancy, because I'm trying to get inside the souls of people from different nations. So German, his fluency in German, German took him from the infantry. He, would, he could have been killed at D-Day. He was training at Manchester for D-Day, being an American boy, but we went to England, you were our allies, and we were training the troops, continuing the training there. And he was plucked out of that to London to study, to be a plank, General Eisenhower to help plan D-Day with other, a hundred other boys, but it was his German. It was his facility with language that got him out of there. Um, and. Uh, used his brain rather than his brawn. So opening night gifts, it is a common practice, particularly, you know, I did this when I had 14 lines in a red dress. Every opening night I gave a gift, but more than that, let's go back to Kinderstube. Kinderstube is children's manners and I'm Lily Felcher's daughter and you don't enter a house without a gift. So I'm seeing Dr. Ruth Westheimer, you know, she's helping with my part so I can get her German, Swiss, Hebrew, French, American accent. And uh, for instance, she thinks she has a terrible voice. So I said, please sing to me. I can't sing to you. But she sings, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. I don't have a melody. And I usually leave the room. So every time I vi visit Ruth Westheimer, whom I adore, she and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg were so wonderful to me. Ruth let me be with her four times before she passed away on September 18th last year. I always bring flowers to Ruth Westheimer. When I went to visit the justice, she loved opera. I went to the Metropolitan Opera. I went to the shop. I know the manager. I have a subscription. Why do I have a subscription? Because I'm a cultured person. Because uh, Jewish people, to get close to God, they study. That's what we do. So you don't have to believe in God to be a good Jew. You have to do a mit you have to do mitzvah, to do acts of love and kindness. And you approximate your own decency and the God spark in you by what? Nose to the grindstone, you study, you make, I'm so envious that you're in college, it's wonderful. Use your brain, my darling, it's in its best shape now. Believe me, as I try to memorize 44 pages of text for Ruth Westheimer, the penny drops deep, but it goes much slower. So you make these opening night gifts to thank people, to live in gratitude. Gratitude is the quickest path to happiness. And the most important people, are not the people playing opposite you. They're the people emptying, your, emptying the, the, the bathrooms, the people who are cleaning. I threw a party when I was in Pippin for the crew and I invited the cast, but whatever, I threw it for the crew. 
I catered a whole meal for the crew. And at one point, a whole meal for the company. And I was just a supporting player. I played Grandma Berta, but I sang upside down. Oh, it's time to start. Oh, it's time to start living. Time to take a little from the world we're given. Time to take time, cause spring will turn to fall in just no time at all. So you sing that, you put an old bird hanging upside down on the trapeze, sing a hit song, and you get a standing ovation, right? That's just That's crazy. Great. I was crazy. I was just so crazy. Thank you, Diane Paulus. So I was so grateful to be in that show and to be chosen by the Weislers, uh, uh, practically without audition. You read, if you read the opening story of the book, you'll see what happened with Barry Weisler and the trapeze. Oh, my God. I got that part without singing or dancing, singing a note or dancing a set. What I did, I gave presents to everybody, including my producers, and thoughtful presents. You can always substitute for money, thought. You can't afford a bouquet, give a person a rose. It's the this, it's the this. So I would never, I go to a very good bakery, I buy Ruth little cookies or uh, Schnecken, uh, except my mother. My mother, whenever, my mother was corrective. She was a preserve and protect mother. Not probably, not unlike your parents, Aiden or your grandparents. So she was always fixing me in order that I should sustain my life, you know? So it was never right, it always had to be fixed. And the message to a child when you're always fixing them is what? That they're not good enough, that they're not enough, that it's not okay who they are. I once had a, uh, an assistant and it was not a good match, a darling girl, matter of fact, we're still our friends. And she said, I can't come here anymore because you criticize me too much. And I said, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. That's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. So when you're ready to correct somebody, see if you can be the solution. It's not so easy. I coach soccer and I, the five to 10 year old girls from New York City. They're all, my son was captain of his team at collegiate and kept at the university, Harvard, and then he played varsity for Oxford. And he was in whatever it was, Vincent, whatever that club was. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I was with the five-year-old girls. I think we called ourselves the Purple Barbies. It was quite something. <laughs> that was the name of our team. And they went, coach, coach, I, 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 I made a goal. I made a goal with my elbow. I made a goal with my elbow. And I said, that's fantastic. I have an idea. Why don't we try your foot? Or try your foot. <laughs> try your foot. So you refocus the child. Yeah. You don't dismantle the child. But people do the best they can in life. You, th you think she knew that she was harming me? She didn't know. And as a result, I have Lilyville. And... You know, can I, can I um, call upon my sadness as a person at the drop of a hat? You bet I can. Yeah. And it's not by being an actor. It's by going back to earlier similar and that black hole of silence from that person in the beautiful starched uh, shirtwaist dress with the double strand of pearls and the sapphire clasp. I'm giving Martha, that's my sister-in-law, I'm giving Martha the pearls. You have all my, you have everything. I'm giving Martha the pearls. I said, give her the pearls, give her the pearls. Just give her the pearls, you know? So Martha, she's such a doll. And I'm sitting here like a lock saying, okay, she's a doll. And it is, is it coming? Is it coming? Sometimes it did, sometimes, sometimes it didn't. Um, but in the end, well, particularly once my father died, that patriarchy died. And she decided to, instead of standing by the spotlight and feeling its warmth, she decided to step in and take her place in our little, in our little extended family, which is ten, dozens of people, particularly with the motherland. And also like many Jewish homes, because of the Holocaust, I have Mark David Felchu in Melbourne. I have Joel Felchu in Caesarea. He was a brigadier general in the Israeli Air Force and the head of El Al. We're very proud of him, also a graduate of MIT. I have my beautiful cousins, Karen Shafron, Philippa Joseph, um, who come from the Gottlieb and Petrakovsky in, in England, along with Flo Kaufman and Aubrey Kaufman and Flo represented the Jewish people to the British crown. So I used to call Cousin Flo. I said, Cousin Flo, how are you? He says, well, I'm going to speak to Philip about the Seder, or maybe he'll be able to come to us for, um, for Rosh Hashanah and just do a little thing. She loved Philip. He was very, uh, as you know now, and may he rest in peace. That was some elegant funeral. I'm sorry for COVID, but that was the most yeah. amazing musical tribute. And it was like you lost your grandpa, or as we'd say on our side of the your street, your Zadie, your Zadie, your grandpa. He was, you think of the control 
and the understanding that strong, athletic, expressive person had to sublimate himself publicly for 73 years. Yes. Pretty extraordinary. I mean, so, so as my mother walked behind my father, so he passed away and then she finally took her place and she was worshiped by the family. And I think that kept her alive as well, not to mention the medical experiment that you will read about at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in uh, uh, 2006. And she would live uh, for another eight and a half years. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I just love the whole everything you've written listening what I was listening to it's just so it's just so amazing like I just love just you know relaxing and just hearing you do the voices do the singing and it is it's so immersive how you do it it's just it's just incredible I, I it's my pleasure and let me tell you something um Tyler your words matter and they're interesting and I love listening to them. So you must, you and Aiden must keep doing this uh, Zoom podcast. Don't ever think you are of small value, you're of great value. And I do toast to all my Walking Dead enthusiasts. Um, I wanna thank you, you've changed, you changed my whole fan base, whatever little fan base I have. But when I started to uh, go back to the nightclubs in New York and people started to show up with nose rings and tattoos, I knew I had made it. I knew I was in like <laughs> Flynn. I had a whole new generation. It's like when I did Yentl, uh, which is a girl disguising herself as a boy in order to become a scholar, I met a massive amount, before it was so free and easy, of, of gay women. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it, it, changed, it changed and enhanced my career. And we don't have a career in theater without a gay following. End of discussion. God, God bless everybody. I was a big advocate for gay marriage because I said, as I was raising funds for them, I said, we as heterosexuals have screwed the whole thing up. We have over a 50% divorce rate. Here are people who <laughs> want to try this, yeah. want to bring children into a stable situation. Let them do it. Let them do it. You know, if they're believers, it's, and, and so it was. And they're very, everybody's very good parent. The tent is expanding, Tyler and Aiden. And we have to get with the program. We do, we do, yeah. Right, we, the, the, uh, and all of you guys, all of you wonderful hunters who understand how to use a gun, okay, but those of you who are going out and killing people in my country, what is the matter with you? What has happened to you? That we have to now pass legislation to prevent you from ever holding a firearm. I mean, what, and I don't know that we'll ever do it, but the country has gone into a bizarre, a time, and I have to say that uh, the prior president brought a lot of this uh, hatred to the surface. And the sad thing is that probably the hatred existed, but it was undercover and quelled. But uh, he 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 really brought everything up in an explosive pustule of of disease. And we will get well. We will get well. You Biden will. is a great. We don't, Biden's a great human being. And again, I'm not talking Democrat or Republican. My father was a Republican, my mother was a Democrat. And that was back in the days when, you know, Republicans were the party of Lincoln. Talking about being a mensch, Joe Biden doesn't, doesn't need the spotlight. He just wants to do his job. And yeah. look what he's done in three months. He's been in office since January 20th and a third of the country is already inoculated, double inoculated. He has changed the face of America already. And uh, we finally have a, a woman of color in a very important position in our, uh, in our government. And it's, it's a huge step forward. I live for the day and it's coming where the coming generations won't even see color. It will be effortless. It'll be effortless. And um, that's what we gotta do. We gotta enfranchise people. Once you enfranchise people, Aiden and Tyler, once you give them stakes in society, the crime drops, believe me. Once they have a beautiful home or a nice home to defend and good food, what do you have to go out and try to rob somebody for? You know? So that's where we must head. We must, we must, we must head into the light. And again, it brings you back to the walking dead and the huge obstacles they faced with the walkers. <laughs> so the walkers were the forces of darkness, of course. 
and Rick and his band were the forces of light. If it if it's good of you, we can we can start talking about Walking Dead. Yes, we can talk about Walking Dead. There is this one's oh, but this one's about what what this show's about, and um, I'm I'm so glad you know we've 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 but we've we've got now we've had both of the two main Monroes. I had uh, Steve on as my fa- second guest. Oh. And he was he was amazing. I've got a I've got a couple of questions about about him and him him being a little bit annoying. <laughs> well, he, <laughs> said, well, he said himself. He said it himself. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, he what happened is that he had what we would call um, a character tick, which is fine. When Stephen would touch me, I'm sure he's my husband. He would not <laughs> touch me like this. He touched me like this. So this was his nervousness and I was exposed to this. I felt like, look, unless this is a vibrator, I don't want this on my back. <laughs> let's, just, let's just discuss this. What is going on? So I said, Stephen, I love you. Could you stop doing that, please? We have to work. I want to look into your eyes. I need some stillness and I don't want this thing going on. But he was adorable and he's a wonder, was a wonderful actor, as were my sons. My wonderful sons. One of them lost their mother during the shoot. It was it was terrible. Yeah, yeah. It was just terrible. That's what uh, Steve was on about. He was like, I, I, he was, I was rubbing, I was rubbing a, rubbing a Toba's arm. I was like, it just have like. But I mean, and... I mean, like Vivace. If we're talking music here, it wasn't like. It was like. <laughs> I said, my God, jeez. So I said, maybe I said maybe his other arm is stiller. Or maybe he just can't touch me. Or what about, I said, what about holding my hand, trying to be the solution? So if I was holding his hand, I would just like have to grip it, keep it still. I don't remember that we touched each other very much, but I certainly loved him and loved working with him and have seen him in other things. He's, he's, he's wonderful. And the set was wonderful. Mikey Strismo, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing, but the DP, who's now running Fear of the Walking Dead, I think in Texas. He was brilliant. Scott Gimple was brilliant. Um, it was just so much I can't call it fun it was like making a feature every week yeah Andy Lincoln Andy Lincoln would come to the set when he wasn't working to watch other people's work I guess other people's because he certainly came to the set to watch mine I said what are you doing here he said I want to watch your work I want to watch what you do I said I'm the one who's learning from you mister he was he was the best leader of any television show I have ever participated in he was the best. Definitely. He was the most giving, the most available. He would get to the set early to greet the what? To greet the gardeners who took care of the grass <laughs> in Alexandria. Want to talk about opening night gifts? This is what I mean. And what it translates to is that when you go down in the elevator in my apartment, I live on uh, Central Park West, you greet the doorman. How are you? You spend an extra second. How are you, Shedra? How are you, Harry? How are you, Michael? How are you, Kenson? How are you, Noam? You spend an extra second, which says you exist. You exist for me. You matter. Um, I, uh, that's why I love doing The Walking Dead, because people were so committed. And then we'd go to these crazy conventions where not only could you make a living, but what could be bad about people telling you you're great for 48 hours? You know, <laughs> Normie, Normie used to have... Um, lines around the block and every time I would come to say hello well what was great about being older there's always a sage in in uh well I don't know if there always is but in TWD there was a sage and it was Herschel and Herschel died and I came so once you're older and you're not a you're not a you're not a sexual target you know America loves new 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 uh, people adopt you as their parent people would come and ask me stories about Uta Hag and my teacher, about Lee Strasberg when I was at the studio. You know, I, I lived in a time where I made my Broadway debut with Christopher Plummer in Cyrano in 1973. And that is 48 years ago. And I entered the legitimate stage at the Tyrone Guthrie Theater, another Brit, Tyrone Guthrie Theater in 1971. So I've been on the professional stage for 50 years. So it, it becomes a different dynamic and a beautiful one. Um, I'm very grateful for this third act. I plan to live to 104, so you're stuck with me. I'm going to outlive my, even my mother. 
<laughs> um, we haven't got much time left, but um, what was your favorite scene in the film? Over you've had you had so many great scenes with you know with Andy with with pretty much every single main main character you worked with because you know Diana is is a key part in the show. She still is, you know her your your home is still standing after after at least 10 years now, I think it's it's with time jumps. Fantastic. That's fantastic. So Alexandria is what's the metaphor for Alexandria? It's the metaphor for civilization. It's order, cleanliness, lack of chaos. Um, I, I loved every scene, but what was exciting was the first scene. First of all, the story of The Walking Dead is, is in the book. It takes up a whole intermission. You know, intermissions are 15 minutes, a big section in the book. I think it's intermission two, intermission two which is Go the most important that. intermission. What? Go check it out. Links in, right. in the description to the right. book and right. all, all the links. Just Lilyville by Tova, folks, on at Amazon, Walmart, uh, Target, your local bookstore. And if you get, uh, if you can't find it, tovafelcher.com, and then you just get on the website, on my website, you push a button about the book and all the places you can buy it pop up. Uh, uh, along with, if you want a, a special personalized uh, uh, booklet. In all events, I got this part while I was on, I knew that I was given this part while I was on an expedition boat in the Galapagos. And Scott Kimball said, we would like you to play Deanna Monroe. I said, I'd like to know who it is because it was my only audition in my entire career where I wasn't given the script and I knew nothing about the series. I, the audition was in a cinder block closet with a 22 year old with a small camera where I was playing the head of the CIA of another country. And I said in, in this experience, I said, welcome to the end of my career. This is the end of my career. And I got on the boat and I got this role and they said, you have to be in uh, Atlanta by a certain date. I said, I'm in the middle, I'm sitting here looking at dodo birds. And I said, I landed in Cartagena on that date. He said, you must fly out, fly you out that night. You have to be here for Monday for costume fittings, etc." And the first scene I had in the series was huge. It was about five pages of, of, of dialogue. It was very big. And I started to work on the script on the plane. I got to Georgia. I settled in um, near Alexandria, uh, outside of, just outside of Atlanta, not in the actual city. And Andrew Lincoln immediately called and said, what do you need? I said, I need to rehearse. I'm born from the classical stage. Would you rehearse with me? And we spent an hour on the phone doing that dialogue. And I came in with him the next day. We shot that scene right out of the box. They just wanted to do a two shot. I'm sorry that they didn't do close ups of each of us it's, more it's often. An really scene. And then the other great one that I loved was with the blood all over my face when I was trying to kill a, a, a walker coming yeah. after me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Episode. Website, I think, or on my Facebook page with the yeah. blood all over my face. It was. Um, it was a joy, you know, it was crazy. They took me to a gun range. I had to learn to shoot a gun, yikes. So it was very, very interesting experience. And uh, my experience of being with The Walking Dead is they, they were terribly, terribly careful. I know there had been one accident in the many years they were there and uh, it was most unfortunate, but they were meticulous, meticulous with fire marshals and and doctors and the everything was ready to rock and roll so nothing could happen to us. I know that like you filmed a lot of the interviews as far as like the introduction, the auditions, if you will, for Alexandria with, you know, Andy Lincoln, Stephen Young, Denai Guerrero, et cetera. Um, did you film any more of those or did you just film the ones that we saw? And were there any other deleted scenes that, you know, you've shot that didn't make the cut? Interesting. <laughs> no. There were certain scenes that were edited, but not heavily. Um, I just did scenes for a marriage, from a marriage for HBO and played Walt, uh, Oscar Isaac's mother. It was a joy, yeah. but they cut a big scene of mine. That, that, that really felt lousy, but that's the way it is. You have to serve the piece. This was not the case. This was not the case. I was just sad to get bitten. Yeah. I thought, my daddy told me that if I, were, I was excellent, everything else will follow. Well, it doesn't. First of all, you need human relationships. 
You have to be excellent at human relationships, not just your work. And I really mean that. People will not put up with a difficult person, no matter how brilliant you are, after a while. They'll just say, this is, this is too much. I can't do this. So take care of your relationships, whether it's with your, the animal world, if you have dogs or cats or horses, or whether it's with other human beings. Yeah. All people want is to be acknowledged. So they were, they were very good to me. And I'm sure, as is the custom, but on my last scene, the entire company came to the set to watch my work. I was with Denai dying on the bed and then i had this idea for the silent scream at the end that was i didn't tell anybody incredible. i didn't tell anybody they did a take and i let out a scream that was crazy and mikey said what i said why not and he said try it again and we'll cut out the sound and then you got that thing about that last mask of a human being last act of courage before they are going into the unknown probably going down and then I had a choice whether or not to be a walker and I said why shouldn't I try to be a walker so they spent two days discussing my makeup and then they sent me to New York for special eyes they made special weirdo contacts that uh, made me look otherworldly <laughs> and I came down and did that scene with my beloved son and uh, I'm glad I did it. You know, I didn't do one of those things where, oh, it's not good for my reputation to show up as a, as a walker, you know. I just, I just did it. I wanted to experience whatever I could experience. Yeah, it was a great honor. It was a great honor to be in The Walking Dead. And people who belittle the show and call it, forgive me now, a zombie show, they're missing the whole, they're missing the whole point. Definitely, yeah. They're missing the whole point. It is... Um, it is a show about the struggle of humanity and humanness to survive. Struggle of humanness to survive. And I am, uh, I'm grateful that it's, is it, isn't it still cooking? I haven't it, watched it. It's got a season left and then it's- One it's, season left, right, one season left. Did so you know that Andy be, left? I did know Andy left, he just wrote me because I asked him about the book. He said, my darling, I don't do any media. But I love you. How are the children? Typical Andy Lincoln. How are the children? How are you feeling? How's COVID going? You know, I, and it's going very well in the United States. It's going very well. Good. You should all write a thank you note to the president of the United States to thank him for efforting to save our lives. To save our lives. Are you, uh, are you fully vaccinated? Or had any vaccinations yet? I've, I've been fully vaccinated for months, thanks yeah. to the president and the vice president. Also, we were older, but now it's 16 and over. So there's no excuse, anybody. There's no excuse. And uh, God forbid, if the variants are coming, you want to be inoculated. You want to have, I have the antibodies because I had COVID last year from the 19th to 19th. And thank God I'm athletic and healthy and didn't have any underlying conditions. Yeah. I was never hospitalized, but it was not a pretty sight. You do not want to get this disease. You certainly don't want to die of this disease. So get inoculated. It's your duty. It's your duty as a citizen in, in a democratic country. I have a beautiful goddaughter, Hannah Felchu, uh, who is also my niece, who is over in Beijing. And they're living the life, life of Riley there. It's not a free society. So they don't mess around. You get messed up. You're isolated. You don't get any choice. Yes. Nothing. But um, they have a pretty full life. I mean, they come, they are masked in the street. I remember the Asian, uh, uh, wonderful Asian tourists here in New York City, always wearing masks before COVID. That was yeah. like their thing. And uh, now I get it. Now I totally get it. But be careful, be humble, be vigilant. You don't, don't, don't get overconfident, even as, as long as this is taking. They just, they just reported a situation where a non-inoculated carrier of COVID reinfected older people who had been inoculated in an old age home here in the United States. So it, it they, maybe these older people who got it again have underlying conditions, but assume nothing, assume nothing. You know, aren't there four principles of, of living a good life? Um, um, <clears throat> uh, keep your word impeccably. But I remember the last one is assume or presume nothing and nothing is personal. You think it's personal, but it's probably coming from the other person's tape. So get inoculated, please. 
and it takes some vigilance. Get on the web. Yeah. There's a lot. You can go to CVS. It's for free. I mean, when I finally got tested for COVID, it was last year it was $625. But I, I got it April 18th. So I wanted to make sure. I didn't even know if I had it. It was so early in February. We didn't know that not having your taste and smell was part of the disease. That was a red flag. It was my brother, David, Dr. David Felchew, educated at Dartmouth, a PhD MD, and also went to London, London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts, headed the theater at Cornell University, and is a medical doctor. Are we afraid of dying? No, we're not. Are we overachievers? Yes, we are. Try to do the best we can in this universe. So my brother David called and said, Tove, they have discovered that having no taste or smell, do you have no taste or smell? I said, yeah, I've just lost, I'm losing weight. I went from 129 to 112 for, with COVID. I lost that much weight. I had no desire to eat and I had no taste or smell. And that was the red flag. So April 18th, I paid a wonderful doctor at Mount Sinai to test me and it was very early, everybody was masked. I was the only person there. Sure enough, I came back with raging antibodies. And I had had the disease and I still got inoculated. Don't think because you had it and you have your yeah. antibodies that you're out of the gate. And then I believe there's gonna be a booster of all things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also, there's, there's a stat for the Johnson & Johnson. It is more likely you will form a clot from birth control pills than you will from the Johnson & Johnson uh, shot. It has been not exaggerated, but from fear, there's been an overcautious reaction, according to yeah. the papers. Yeah, so. there's a lot of stuff going in the fear. I just, just get it. I got it. I got it, luckily, um, very early this year because of work. And I was like, yep, I'm, I need it. You know, I don't want to live in like did a you get did, did, did you get COVID or you got your vaccination oh, got, I, got, I got both vaccines sorry yeah yeah so got, did you well, ever did you ever get COVID no you know what's interesting myself and three other girlfriends we all got COVID and none of our husbands got COVID so that was weird and wonderful mm -hmm. my husband Andrew Harris Levy never got sick yeah. yeah I'm glad you're you know I'm glad you're safe and uh, I am so saying, you know, the kids, the kids of my children are in their 30s. They've been double inoculated. They're finished and uh, and the quarantine's ended, but they have three, have three grandchildren. So one of them goes to school and I don't mind if he comes back with a cold, which is common, but God forbid, as a two-year-old, he should, God forbid, anybody gets sick. So mm -hmm. they're all masked and we hope for the best, but be humble. We still have not gone inside a theater, have not gone inside a restaurant. We eat outside, either in a separate igloo, which they sanitize. We went yeah. to a fancy restaurant and pay an extra 50 bucks and the sanitation team comes in and sanitizes it from the last client. And you have a fear-free meal, but mostly we eat outside. We don't even eat in those plexiglass things outside where you're connected to everybody. Some of the, some of the lesser restaurants who can't afford it, they just do outside dining in, you know, under a roof with one side open, but you have no barriers between the tables and we don't even do that. No. So there we are, guys. It Let's end on a happy note. By <laughs> Lilyville, the solving of a 65 year relationship with my mother, Lillian Kaplan Felchu, the daughter of a British subject. There you go. We love her. She lived long enough. And then on the back are my roles as Catherine Hepburn and Golda. And let's see, oh, there's the bloody shot. You see the bloody shot of Deanna Monroe? There's Deanna, Yentl, Law and Order, Holocaust. There's the Trapeze Act in Pippin, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Hello Dolly, Naomi Bunch, where's the bathroom? Where's the bathroom? I need to find your bathroom. Tell me that you have a bathroom in this hovel you call home. Hovel, notice hovel. She's already ready to fix and there's Kath on that phone. So you'll have a, taste of what it means to have a good relationship and what it means to be able to maintain it despite one's uh, life in theater, film, and television. You'll, you'll love it. Everyone, if, I mean, only YouTube could, can get the links, but I'll, I'll post it on my social media everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for coming. Thank you for um, agreeing and you know, all the staff. It's just been amazing. I never Wonderful to, to get here. Aiden, we are, we are, our hearts are an open book. It's my pleasure to be supported by, I mean, Tyler, you're not Aiden, <laughs> by, that's really good, Tova. That's called aging is optional because God, I hope it is. Um, Tyler and Aiden, thank you for your time and thank you for the support of my first memoir. 
my very, very first memoir. I hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you, love. And I hope it brings, um, I hope it brings you insight. I hope it stops a conveyor belt on the parent-child relationship and on the full life movement and on solving your relationships while people are still on this earth. If you love someone, tell them, tell them. Thank you so much. I hope your next interview goes well and you know you have a good rest of your day because only what it's almost four o'clock for you so it's only it just I have, my next my next interview is at one so i should let you go oh, sorry. And, and finish my cucumber salad i feel <laughs> like i'm in i feel like i'm in <coughs> a british play i'm having cucumber salad you know <laughs> thanks guys thanks it's aiden sure. thanks thank tyler much. over there in plymouth thank you very much thank you very much for, for coming thank bye you bye, bye. bye. thank you